Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Thank you for those online today celebrating Rich's life. I want to first by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Suzanne Johnson, our current president of Green River College. Thank you and welcome all of you here in person and the many who are joining this event online. It is an honor to welcome you to Green River College on behalf of our board of trustees, all the faculty and staff who work here and who carry on the legacy of President Rich Rakowski. They have told me I have a maximum of five minutes <laughs> and to be timely about it. I've been thinking about this moment since the passing of Rich. How does one measure the life of a man? And one so extraordinary as Rich Wachowski was. I wholly believe he's watching today and uh, he's probably telling a few fish stories and warming up some magic tricks. So Rich, I hope you can see all who are here today. We think about legacy in a person's life and you can all, I hope, since it's not raining today as well, you can look around this beautiful campus, you can see the facilities, you can see the presence of our wonderful resources around this college campus and Rich is here. You look at each other in this room right now and think about all the roles and positions he held on and off this campus and Rich is here. You think about the man's impact in the communities, the boards that he served on, the work that he did at the State Board on behalf of Green River College and all the colleges within our system. And Rich is there. You think about the thousands, literally thousands of students' lives that he touched. And Rich is there. We often think about legacies as buildings, names on structures. But I believe that Rich would be most proud of the legacy that he has left in every student who came here, in every employee who has ever worked here, and for all of us who have the honor to continue his dream and vision for this institution. Thank you, Rich Rakowski. Thank you, President Rakowski, for all that you have given us and for all that we have the honor and the responsibility to carry on today and to all of our tomorrows. So with that, I welcome you all to today. We will celebrate this individual's life. We will acknowledge the legacies. We will spend time together and celebrate a life that shows the true meaning of what it means to leave the world a better place than when you came. Thank you. Okay, somebody's got to be charged here and say, when I get done, push this back down. This for Mel's thing last year, I left it high, and that was uh, not very, kind of awkward for people. I'm Earl Hale, and I uh, used to work in the state office with all the colleges. And, and, uh, and when I first got to know Rich when he was over at Highline, and, uh, and then later uh, here at uh, Green River, and I've got a lot of stories I could tell about Rich, part of which I could tell today and part of which I probably shouldn't. But he was a great guy and uh, did a, uh, an outstanding job, both on behalf of the system 
and here at Green River. Uh, from where I, from my perspective, I, I kind of know two sides of Rich. And the first is the, probably the reason I'm standing here is the community college side, both the system and the local roles and leadership role that he played. But then there's a personal side to him, a social side to him that uh, we got to know over the years and we did a lot of things. There's, there's a lot of fish that are still swimming around in the bay that I tried to drown when he'd take me fishing with him and I never caught anything and he caught the fish. <laughs> so anyway, I'd like to briefly start off with the community college perspective a little bit and then we can talk a little bit about some of the personal things that we did together. Uh, after uh, Rich left Highline Community College, he came over here to the Green River as a finance guy and then became the president. And uh, I guess the first thing I would say when I think about him as a player in the college system, there are 34 colleges around the state, is that he was a, a very active participant in the, uh, in the larger system game. Uh, he was an active player in the game. He uh, particularly understood how financial decisions, some of you that worked with him will understand what I'm saying, understand uh, how financial decisions were made uh, in the system and who got the money and how it was all split up and everything. And uh, uh, in addition to the financial stuff that he became a real expert on and certainly one of the people that was helping me do my job, uh, but there are a couple other things that I'd like to cite that, that he did as, at the state level. One is become active in, uh, in developing higher education policy statewide for all of higher ed, all the community colleges and the technical colleges. But we even got into the business of working with the universities, and tuition and transfer agreements and things like that. And uh, one example I'd like to cite uh, in terms of the policy area that Rich was very engaged in was in 1994, there was a bill called the Workforce Training Act, and it was a, a bill that was authorizing the community and technical colleges to place a priority on retraining dislocated workers, because that was a time when Boeing was going through one of their periodic downturns, and, uh, and also uh, a lot of timber people were being laid off out on the peninsula and the like, and the legislature came to us and said, we think you guys are positioned correctly to work with adults that need to be retrained for new jobs. And uh, that turned into quite a fight because there was a big issue about where the money would come from. And you're talking a fair amount of money when you look at the programs mostly around the state. And, uh, and Rich got very involved in that and uh, was very helpful. And he stimulated the other presidents to get equally as engaged. And uh, so that's, that's an example of a higher ed policy issue that Rich took a leadership role in. And uh, the, the third point that I would touch on in terms of his role with uh, the system level was, I guess, the, the thing I've already touched on is the legislative relationship. He was the chair of uh, the president's committee. The president's group at that time had subcommittees and had one on the legislature. And he was the chair of that. And he took that very seriously, very actively, uh, encouraged all of the other presidents to get us engaged and work the legislature and out and work the hill and figure out what bills we liked and which bills we didn't like and how much money we needed and how much money we were going to get and all of that. And uh, the whole issue of, of legislative affairs was, a, was an area that, that interested Rich a lot and he became very active. And I have one story, to, to, one, more, one more story to tell, uh, and I can check with Shirley on this, but uh, I think Rich used to take the job home with him at night because the lady on our staff that was doing most of the legislative stuff, a lady by the name of Sandy Wall, and she said the phone used to ring between 9 and 10 o'clock at night. She says, I knew who it was. It was Rich. <laughs> with some question about the legislature or has somebody been contacted or has this committee hearing been covered or all this kind of stuff. And I talked to Sandy just the other night. I said, you have any Rakowski stories you want me to share? And she said, well, the one thing about those phone calls is that he was always right on target. He was asking important questions about important subjects. She says those were not wasted phone calls, even when they were at 930. And uh, that, that says a lot about Rich, both his work hours and, and how he used that time. Uh, 
So, so anyway, to, to sum up the uh, the, uh, the the work that Rich did at the system level, I'd just say that he was a team player. He was part of the glue that held this system of 34 colleges together so we could leverage our collective influence, whatever we had. Uh, and, and he was great with the other presidents. They listened to him and they watched him as he worked uh, on these state level policies and political issues. At the local level, and I'm not gonna steal McIntyre's thunder, there he is right over there. Uh, I can talk a little bit about what I know about his role here at Green River, but I was, remember, 50 miles away. And so I, I won't, won't be as closely, but he was knowledgeable about finance and budget issues and how our office made decisions about who got what on capital projects, capital buildings, re renovations, and then who got the operating dollars and uh, who got the enrollment growth that would be, which was a surrogate for funding. If FTE students was a, uh, another word for money. And uh, anyway, uh, the, the example that I have on the local uh, project was the capital budget knowledge that he brought to the table. And he had the community college capital budget, the facility budget, was a complicated process. You might imagine with 34 colleges all with sharp elbows wanting to get on the list of projects that the legislature is going to fund. But Rich figured out the game. He figured out how to play the game. And you can walk around this campus, including this building and a few others, and you can just see the impact that he had on our office and on the system capital budget to bring resources back to this campus. And that that's uh, one of the things that stuck in my mind because I was on the other side of the game a little bit and, and watching him work that. Uh, uh, one last thing I'd touch, touch base on in terms of the legislative role he played is that as, as, as I was the state guy, uh, Rich was always looking for state policy issues that he was interested in, but state policy and finance issues that are important to Green River Community College. And that's, that was significant. And what I did, I quickly figured out that I was looking for where the lines crossed. If I could get an issue down there that was important to me and the rest of the system, but also it was gonna be important to Green River, then I would have Rakowski working on the problem with me and the whole thing worked out a lot better. And having him on my side of the table was always better than the other way around. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's, uh, uh, that's just a, a little, but, uh, but when I tell that story, I, I, I'm serious about that. Rich would, as we all know, was a very intense guy and a very focused guy, but he focused on things that he thought were important. And if he thought something like this was important, then he'd go after it, like that Workforce Training Act. And if he didn't, well, you know, you can't have a little trouble catching him on the racquetball court or something. So anyway, uh, now Mike will, will give you a more of a local perspective on, on his leadership style and what he meant to this campus. But from 50 miles away, those were the kinds of things that struck me that, that he brought back here uh, and to the whole system. On a personal basis, uh, Rich and Shirley and Camille and I, my wife sitting right down here with Shirley, uh, got to know each other personally over the years, going to system meetings, trustee meetings, president's meetings, uh, campus events, fishing trips up on the north end of Vancouver Island. Uh, and, uh, and so, we, so we, did, we socialized some together. And uh, some folks always used to tell me, don't socialize with the presidents because you're making budget decisions and affecting them. Yes or no, up or down. I said, ah, it works out all fine. And, and I never had any regrets becoming a friend of Rich Rakowski's and doing my job at the same time. And for some of you in here, you'll know what I'm talking about, that that was a significant decision. Uh, Rich was a racquetball player. He was a good racquetball player. And he and I used to play racquetball whenever we could get some time out of a president's meeting or I was gonna be up here, he was gonna be down there. And one of the things that I suspected he thought about, I know I thought about was, now do I want to beat this guy that I'm also working with? <laughs> one, more, one more minute, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay. Uh, or not. And, uh, and I suspect that Rich said the same thing. Do I want to beat the state guy or not, you know? And, but the one thing I can assure you that when we played racquetball, he was out to win. <laughs> I don't think he ever cut me any slack at all in all the years that we played racquetball. Uh, 
trips to the north end of Vancouver Island. I got one minute to go and I can do this and leave it in one minute. There are two things about those trips that I remember. One was fishing. He was a fisherman and I think somebody in here is gonna talk a little bit about his fishing experiences and uh, uh, give you some insights as to how he was up there on the island with his boat and everything. The other thing is that we were always kind of the side benefit of that is watching out for orcas. And, uh, and Rich had a little radio in the boat and he would pick up the radio traffic between the companies that were actually looking for orcas as a tourist business. And, and he'd find out where the pods were and then we would go over closer to the pods. And the, the, the one story on that is that we were out there one day, it was the last time we went up to Canada, I think, with them. We had a, uh, 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 the, the, the radio had told us where to go and we went over and there was this pod of whales and we're sitting here watching the orcas and all of a sudden one of them breaks off and comes over towards us. And we're, this boat was what, 22 feet long? So my one that big. And an orca whale looked pretty damn big next to it. And, uh, and, and, he, and he swam right at us and he got about 40 feet away. And we were actually making eye contact with this whale because he was really close. I mean, like from here to that glass wall back there. And then he went down. And, uh, and so we all went to the other side of the boat, watched him come back up. Never saw him again. So underneath the boat, he either took a left or a right and never came back. But that was, that was a fun experience. It was the closest I've ever been to an orca whale. So on that note, I used up my five minutes and probably a couple more. Uh, I, con I consider Rich a colleague and a friend, and I can't say enough good things about him. And, uh, and I'm other sure that other people today are gonna give you stories that, uh, that speak to both the colleague and the friend nature of the guy. But anyway, uh, Rich was, a, was a, certainly a friend of mine and he was a valuable asset to this college and to the community college system. And down it goes. <laughs> I'm actually taller than Earl realizes. Um, Shirley, uh, Anne Marie, Renee, Paul, first of all, uh, on behalf of my husband, myself, and everyone in this room, I extend our sincere sympathy in your loss of your beloved husband, father, brother. He loved and treasured each of you. Um, and I'll tell you how I have a bit of the opportunity to know that as I speak. I'm Linda Cowan. I'm the former superintendent of the Auburn School District, as well as a former trustee here at Green River Community College. Rich was a model of what every one of us as educators want in our students. Rich was a lifelong learner. Rich was raised in the projects outside of Buffalo, New York. His mother told him, logically, that the way out of the projects was through education. Rich was the top student in every school he attended, K through 12, to the point that he received a four-year full-ride scholarship to Kinesis College. Kinesis in Buffalo, New York is what Seattle U is here in Seattle. It is a uh, Jesuit school, small and very uh, uh, rigorous. Anyhow, Rich uh, attended Kinesis. After two years, he switched schools, probably to his mother's dismay, and went to the University of Detroit to study aeronautical engineering. As a part of their program at the University of Detroit, they sent, had an internship sort of program with Martin Marietta, am I too much feedback? Um, uh, Martin Marietta in Denver, Colorado. So you can see, uh, and then after that, he went to the University of Michigan, got an MBA. So here's a man with an aeronautical engineering degree and an MBA. You can see why the Boeing company was very interested in Rich. So that brought him to the Northwest. Also, um, uh, you, he did other jobs along the way, but um, we'll, we'll get to that. I first met Rich and Shirley at Gilda Ray Elementary when Anne-Marie and Renee were students there, and I was their elementary principal. 
Rich and Shirley were great PTA members. And as I reflect on that time, I remember a conversation I had with Rich with regard to the curriculum at the elementary school in the Auburn School District at that time. And we talked about the spelling curriculum, and he knew a lot about it. And I'm saying, how does this man know so much kind of in depth? But it comes back to his lifelong, being a lifelong learner. Uh, Earl mentioned the racquetball club. My husband, Bud, and, he, and Rich both belong to the racquetball club here in Auburn. Racquetball is somewhat of a three-dimensional billiards game. And Rich shared with me on one of our mini carpool rides that he saw the geometry of the game, you know, amazing the mind. When I became superintendent of schools in Auburn, um, Rich was the president of this beautiful college, and we met professionally in all sorts of different situations, uh, one of which was the Cities and Schools Forum. We both believed that the, school, the schools were a reflection of our community. Our mayor of Auburn, Nancy Backus, is here, and, and they still meet to this day, and that started probably 40 years ago with the cities here and the schools, higher ed, getting together to talk about what we had in common. Rich also was a, you know, a practitioner of the Carver governance model, knew it thoroughly. He was a respected leader. Thank you, move it back. Okay, um, a respected leader and highly organized. And it was so much fun for me to attend graduations here at Green River because of his profuse enthusiasm for each of those students and their success. He was so thrilled. He was a great community member, a member of the Kiwanis Club, but he would come to our Rotary Club for the scholarship show because he knew personally how important scholarships were and cared about each student in this community. It wasn't until Rich and I became board members of what was then the School Employees Credit Union and Pemco Insurance Company that I really got to know how diverse Rich was in his interest because we carpooled to get into Seattle together. Um, I knew he was knowledgeable about elementary curriculum. He was a strategic racquetball player. He was a community leader, a successful president, highly organized. He also had high emotional IQ, the EQ that we hear about today, and cared a lot about people. We would talk about my daughters and his daughters along each month, kind of checking in to see what was going on. But he knew many fields. He had his own business in Burien of being a tax accountant with multiple offices, you know, and then went on to Highline Community College after that. Um, he knew uh, about aeronautical engineering, obviously, fishing, you'll hear about, backgammon, I'm sure we'll probably hear about, the stock market, uh, moles and voles, um, and, and as you being lifelong learners, if you don't know what a vole is, it's something uh, to look up, but I'm sure when Rich arrived in heaven, one of his first stops was saying, God, why did you create both of those? Um, anyhow, I was personally blessed uh, with Rich's photography skills when we'd attend a conference. Together, Rich was our photographer. He'd stage us, and then at Christmas time, we'd get these lovely CDs, uh, all very, very professional. Rich was also a skilled craps player. At a conference in Las Vegas, I asked Rich to teach me craps. He knew all the odds. I was a lousy learner, but it's kind of fun to think because Robert Wales in the room, who's the reporter for our local newspaper, and of a, a picture of the college president and the school superintendent in Las Vegas playing craps, showing up on the front page of the Auburn Reporter. Anyhow, Rich and I were also avid Sudoku players, um, and we would you know, compare notes on solving them. He saved one that he couldn't solve and brought it to me, but it speaks to his EQ, a way to connect. Rich found ways to connect with people from all backgrounds. He would discover your interests and remember them and remember your kids' names. Um, he uh, cared about each of his fellow board members um, in, as we worked with him, but he cared most about his family and about this college and each and every student. 
But as I reflect, I look back and decide not only was he a lifelong learner, Rich was a Renaissance man, a person who has in-depth knowledge about so many different fields and carried that with such grace and no arrogance in a, a, a gift to each and every one of us. As Dr. Johnson said, uh, Rich leaves behind not a memorial of steel and stone, although as you walk around this campus, you could say there is, and there is the uh, Rutkowski Learning Center, but rather uh, he leaves behind the lives who he has touched, the people with whom he worked, a memorial in the lives of the students for whom he labored so diligently, so hard, into such late hours of the night. We who are left behind are blessed that he had the courage, the dignity, the integrity to touch us personally and at a meaningful level. Rich Rutkowski will be deeply missed, but his spirit abides still, and that's a spirit of love, a spirit of faith, and of hope that he imparted that will continue to guide and inspire us. Thank you. My name is Mike McIntyre. I had the privilege of working with Rich for nearly 40 years. Rich was a leader, a decision maker, and a visionary. As the other speakers have said, his impact on Green River College will be felt for decades. After Rich's retirement, we continued to meet. Our personal friendship lasted nearly a half a century. Hard to believe. When I asked to speak at today's celebration, many thoughts came to mind, far too many. Simply stated, it's not possible to do justice to the fruits of our relationship of nearly 50 years in four and a half minutes. This morning after being asked to speak, I drove up to Lakeland Hills Starbucks. That's where Rich and I last had coffee. And I pondered what to say. There's so much to say, but what I really thought about was we were a team, Rich and I, and 50 years of teamwork was amazing. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about teamwork. Privately, I've thanked Rich many times for the freedom, trust, faith, and support he gave to me over the years. It was a gift. It had an immense impact on my life. Now I want to publicly thank him for these gifts of friendship and support. It was amazing. I soon realized what I wanted to share was the essence of Rich's qualities. The former speakers have hit on him, but his qualities were amazing. His thoughtfulness, his creativity, and in my opinion, his number one attribute was his strategic mindset. When solving challenges, Rich was unequaled in considering every detail and option before moving forward. I also got those calls at nine and 10 o'clock at night saying, what do you think? He really didn't ask me, he knew, but he wanted to confirm uh, that was Rich. It was within this context that Rich and I loved to discuss possibilities. I think that's why we became such good friends. We loved to sit and talk and talk about opportunities and possibilities. It seems appropriate today to share the ideas, some of the ideas we worked on over the years. There were many. The development of the Green River Foundation. GRCC locations in Enumclaw, Kent, and downtown Auburn. The Artists and Speaker Series, the Green River Jazz Festival, Kent Sister Cities, KGRG, the Children's Theater, the Foundation Golf Tournament, the development of international programs, and many, many more. Given the time restraints, she's right there, 
I decided to focus on two ideas we pursued together. The important thing is these ideas required teamwork, and Rich and I were a, a team, and they had a major impact on the college. Rich often referred to us as a team. He called me the idea man, and I called him the strategist. He kind of worked for us. We were a team. The first idea I want to talk about is the college foundation. In somewhere in the 1974, I was appointed, appointed the director of student programs responsible for the extracurricular life of the student body. Soon after assuming the position, I realized I had more ideas than money. Ever been there, Earl? It was going to be impossible to implement my vision for the program without finding additional resources. I suggested to my boss, Earl Norman, who many of you knew, that the college develop a foundation to fund innovative ideas and student scholarships. After talking with Mal Lindblom, the college president, Earl gave me his blessings and I went looking for allies. Lo and behold, I found Rich in the business office who was new to the campus. He liked the idea and agreed to work with me. We enjoyed many hours meeting with individuals and groups and plotting and strategizing on how to proceed. We discovered our strengths blended well. Little did we know that this was the beginning of a team that was gonna to work together for the next 30 years. A plan evolved that was supported by Helen Smith and Bill Canelli, board of trustee members. Both became excited about the concept of a foundation. Helen offered to host a dinner at her home in Enumclaw to discuss the idea of the foundation. The key players were invited, the college president, the deans, and faculty leaders. Over dinner, the foundation and principal was formed that evening. That evening, Helen and Bill made their initial contributions to the foundation. Under the directions of Clark Townsend and George Frazier, the foundation grew and grew. Today, it has a $20 million endowment fund that provides over 300 scholarships to students. Thank you, George. The second idea was the establishment of an international program. I really think this provides insight into Rich's creative, visionary, and strategic abilities, and he had all of them, believe me. It was no easy task establishing international programs. We needed all the creativity, vision, and strategy we could muster. It all started one spring afternoon in the 80s. I received a phone call from a colleague up north. The caller, the caller said he could put Green River in contact with a group in Japan that wanted to open a branch of a U.S. college. It was to be built on the site of their, their golf course in Kanama, Japan. He assured me the group had financial resources and political connections. However, there was one catch. There's always a catch, isn't there? <laughs> Uh, they wanted to meet the following week in Japan. The management group of the golf course was holding their annual meeting and wanted a representative, representative of the college to attend. I called Rich Royals was in Olympia. He suggested I come down and discuss the opportunity. So off to Olympia I went. We considered the opportunity for a few hours and decided to proceed. As Rich said, you miss every shot you don't take. He didn't want to miss it. The next week found both of us in Japan meeting with Green River soon to be Japanese partners. After seven long days and nights of negotiations, I was going nuts. Seven nights of talking and drinking and meeting and we still hadn't agreed on anything. So Rich and I had a meeting and he said, what I'm gonna do is meet with the chairman of the board and we'll make a decision. So they met, he came out of the meeting and he said, we have a decision and we got to go home, Shirley. <laughs> and uh, an agreement was reached. This was the beginning of international programs at Green River. Under the leadership of Nancy Kramer, Ross Jennings, Wendy Stewart and others, the Green River International Program has grown, grown to be one of the top in the country. 
The Green River Foundation and international programs are two of the many, many ideas implemented within the Rakowski's vision for Green River College. As everybody has said, long may Rich's legacy and memory live on. Thank you. Hi, Shirley. How you doing? Yeah. So, on behalf of PEMCO and everybody there, our condolences to you. Shirley, uh, you asked if I could share my perspectives of Rich, the business person, knowing that uh, he has such a rich life of education. And many of you here are educators or related to education. So the question, is, is when he became the business person, when he joined us on our board, was it the same rich? Or did he behave or transform in, in some way? I'm gonna give you my insights, okay? In 2004, we set out to recruit new board members. Pemco Mutual is a regional insurance company headquartered in Seattle. We're customer centric. We take the long view, but we're not subject to the whims of Wall Street. We needed board members who aligned with our values of integrity, responsibility, and courage. We looked for proven servant leaders. For this particular role, we were looking for someone who had high emotional IQ, a business savvy, a leader in higher education, and was entrepreneurial. That was a big order. Our director of government relations suggested we meet with Rich. He warned me that Rich was a maverick among community college leaders. Rich operated outside the traditional box. Not sure what I was getting myself into, I met with Rich under the guise of wanting to know this campus better and this college better. This is what I observed. He was proud of the school. He shared with me a forward-looking vision. He wanted to serve more students and he wanted to prepare him for life. He, with others, solved some of the funding issues by creating a unique mechanism to provide the residential program for foreign students. But he also said the program not only created additional funds, but more global diversity for the campus, and all students would benefit. He not only had a big vision, but he also liked big things. At that time, there was construction going on to add more space. It was evident he had a finger on all design elements. You could tell it as he walked around and explained this and that and this and why this was occurring. And we started our tour right out here at the Commons. That's where he wanted to start the tour. This is where, he's, this is where that big granite ball sits. And he told me this is where connections could be made. In this granite ball in the courtyard fountain, Rich knew the exact weight of it. And he told me what the weight was. And then he made me move it. And at first, you know, kind of hit, he says, no, move it. So the water goes around and it's got, it, it moves and you, you're, you're amazed. He insisted I continue to rotate it. And then he told me, this is more than art. It's a hands-on physics lessons that will be shared by so many. He seemed to know everyone we encountered. When people saw him coming, they came our way instead of scurrying away. That gives you a lot of insight about a leader. Before each board meeting, there's always some social time. During these social settings, we got lessons about fishing. He would say, and I have this in my head. It's the process that catches the fish. I never had the opportunity to fish with him, but I suspect Rich, the engineer, was constantly tinkering to improve the process. His love of big things also showed up one day at, at the company for a board meeting with a monster-sized pickup truck that simply wouldn't fit in any parking facility we had. And so afterwards, we had to create a special parking stall for him. 
During COVID, we retreated to virtual meetings. And Rich would join each meeting with his camera initially focused on a great big fish trophy. Eventually, he would appear on the screen. And I realized that this might not be more, might not be accidental. I think he was reminding us he was the alpha dog of fishing. <laughs> when he sold the boat, we started, like you, getting monthly lessons on catching moles and the difference between moles and volts. And again, he explained the process in great detail. No one's perfect. Rich had many strengths, but one strength I never observed was him keeping up with his email. <laughs> Aboard as a team, we each bring our traits to our roles. Rich became our team photographer. Whenever we traveled, he was the one who took the pictures and shared them with us. Pictures create reflection. They create memories. They can bond people. His Christmas cards were nature at its best, reflecting places that he and Shirley have visited. His finance and engineering background made him a great candidate to chair our audit compensation committee for many years, always interested in improving the process. Whenever he reviewed a complex topic or situation, Rich had this trait. He frequently let others go first, and then he summarized what he heard. I've seen head nods out there. You know what I'm talking about. That trait adds clarity to a complicated process. It is very beneficial to have on your team. Process, the noun, is a systemic series of actions to achieve a result. Rich believed in process to get big results. The last time we were together, it was our board day of reflection with the executive team, and Rich and I sat together. We were all trying to better understand the root issues of racial inequity, and how could we make a bigger difference in a company, our personal lives, and the communities we serve. Once again, Rich listened and waited to speak. And he, he then summarized from the perspective of those in society who have been left behind in a way that was very insightful for all of us. Regardless of his role, Rich was always the educator. We will miss him. Thank you for sharing his time with us. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Austin. I'm the GISA Credit Union Board Secretary. And I'm here to share about uh, my reflection on uh, sharing board time with Rich on the Credit Union Board. And I'll just talk about what he meant to me, what he meant to the Credit Union Movement, and how his vision of helping people succeed was so apparent to what I heard from him and what I've heard today. I met Rich about six years ago when I joined the Inspirus Credit Union Board, and he was chair. And I was just immediately impressed by his professionalism, his leadership, and his ability to connect with people. Like all things in life, R Rich was really dedicated to his passion and success of our credit union. He joined the School Employees Credit Union in 2004 and served diligently on the board for decades, and his chair oversaw the largest credit union merger in the state of Washington with GISA Credit Union. In the words of our current chair, Greg Andrews, the merger was possible because of Rich. As a key member of leadership, he guided us through the process, and although there are challenges, he remained positive and forward-looking. He was always considering the interests of both the credit unions, and I appreciated his honestness and thoughtfulness, honesty and thoughtfulness. And then sometimes I think back and ask myself, why did Rich take so much time to work on all these big things? He took time out of his retirement when he could have been fishing more or traveling with Shirley more or boating more, things he loved. But I think he did it because he cared and he cared about our members and he cared about people. And he cared about lifting people up through education and financial success and helping them get a start on life to be able to succeed and have a really fulfilling life like he did. And just on a personal, le personal level, I had the pleasure of traveling with Rich at many conferences, like other people mentioned. I went to Washington, D.C. with him. And I just remember over long dinners where he'd savor every bite and savor every sip of his martini, we'd have talks about his time here at Green River and he'd share stories with me 
Um, and, and he was so humble about it. And I think in, to a stranger, unless you really prodded him, you wouldn't know how much vision he had uh, in this part of his life and in so many others. But then once you got him talking, you could see how proud he was and how proud he was of all the programs and policies and people that he impacted. And his humility didn't stop with his work. Uh, he was so sincere in terms of its interest in people. And he, as a lifelong educator, like Linda mentioned, he always wanted to know what my daughter was learning in preschool or kindergarten. And he wanted to know the details of how she was being taught. And then he would always say, how are Lexi and Jack doing, Andrew? How are your kids? Um, and it was so sincere in terms of the way he approached wanting to know the whole of everyone, not just the professional hat they were wearing at the time. Um, and that's just who he was. He was thoughtful, visionary, abundantly caring for others. And whether it was the thousands of credit union members or the friend who was sitting next to him at dinner, I was so honored to call Rich a friend and all of us at ESA will miss him. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an engineering background as well. And to be quite honest with you, I am not very comfortable with public speaking. So I'm going to make this very, very brief. In fact, I prepared just a few note cards so uh, th that I can hopefully breeze right through this. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for coming today to help celebrate the life of my dear, dear brother, Rich. I know that all of you knew him quite well. Perhaps it was right here at Green River College or the fishing club or the Kiwanis or on one of his fishing trips, his many, many fishing trips. So you knew him well. What I'd like to do is tell you a few things that you didn't know about my dear brother, Rich. First of all, he was my big brother, so he was always looking out for me. Always my best interests were at his heart. But how would you know that? Let me share with you an example. On one of our fishing trips at the very start, we had to gas up the truck and top off the boat. So we drove down the hill to the gas station in Auburn. Now, when we got out of the truck, I said, Rich, let me get this. He looked at me rather sternly and he said, Paul, I don't think so. The truck has an oversized gas tank and it has a 30 gallon reserve tank to boot. <laughs> well, I thought to myself, we're only gonna top off the boat. How bad could that be? So I said, Rich, let me top off the tanks on the boat. He said very sternly, Paul, I don't think you wanna do that. <laughs> Well, I said, I insist. So finally he relinquished and he gave in. So we started pumping gas. He at the truck and myself at the boat. Ding, another gallon. Ding, another gallon. Ding, another gallon. This seemed to go on for eternity. So I peered, I looked at the, at the gas pump and what I saw was, $191, 192, 93, 94, 95, 96. Oh my goodness, he was right. As usual, once again, he was right. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> now, many of you probably know that Rich was into magic tricks in a big way. 
And he used the rings, which I have here, to demonstrate a number of things, one of which was teamwork. So I'm told at the staff meetings, he wasn't interested in talking about butts in seats. He was interested in talking about teamwork. And he used the rings to show us, to show everyone that we're all connected, without a doubt. And that was very important to him. Now, he tried to teach me a few of the simple tricks. And I was, uh, you know, sort of uh, lukewarm. And one of them that he, that he wanted to teach me was uh, the disappearing red ball. Okay. So I sort of listened, and uh, here's sort of how it went. Now you see it, now you don't. <laughs> now you see it, now you don't. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me just say this. Let me just say this. I obviously failed miserably, and he gave up after that. No more magic tricks for me. Now, most of you may or may not know that he was an avid fisherman. And uh, he was a perf an absolute perfectionist at filleting fish, especially white fish, which is more difficult than, than salmon. He was like a skilled neurosurgeon when he would fillet the whitefish. He was so good at it that he told me, Paul, and now before I say that, uh, I live in Chicago, so on every annual fishing trip, I would bring back a lot of fillets, much of which was whitefish. So he told me once, he said, Paul, if you ever find a bone in a whitefish fillet, I will buy you a jug of scotch. <laughs> so, there are many years I was searching real hard for the whitefish <laughs> back at home. I was looking for that elusive bone. And in fact, uh, I even thought of going to the local fish market <laughs> and asking for a fillet of whitefish that had a few bones left in, <laughs> left in it, and I had my eyes on that big jug of scotch, you know, the one with the big handle. At any rate, honesty prevailed, and I never did that. Now, one of the things that you may not know about Rich is that he was enamored with the cosmos, Carl Sagan, and especially the stars. So much so that he and Shirley, on numerous occasions, traveled all the way to Utah so that he could get the perfect time-lapse photo of the Milky Way. It's here on display, and I hope you get a chance to see it a little later. Now, he also took a navigation course, Navigation by the Stars. One time, as we were talking about this on the phone, he said, you know, Paul, I am amazed that the early mariners could navigate by the stars and determine where they were on the face of the planet within five miles on the face of the planet. I said to myself and thought, hey, Rich, why don't you just use the GPS on your boat? <laughs> and furthermore, I said, Rich, if you use your cell phone, you can get within five feet. At any rate, he didn't listen to me. He completed the course and I'm not sure if he passed the final or not. But one thing is clear, he was always interested in, in improving by taking uh, additional courses. That was his appetite. And finally, my dear brother Rich, may all of your new adventures be guided by all of the heavenly stars up above. Thank you.
Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here in tribute to Rich Rutkowski, president of Green River College. When I arrived at Green River 15 years ago now, <laughs> I know that Rich enjoyed jazz music, apparently along with, uh, I'm learning racquetball and backgammon. I knew about the fishing though. <laughs> And uh, I also can imagine he would enjoy and uh, be pleased to have the students performing today, students he loved to serve. I chose this first song uh, for the students to learn, especially for today, because of its backstory, which I'd like to share with you briefly. Um, this is a jazz standard. The music was written by George Gershwin. And this was the last song George Gershwin wrote before he passed from a, a brain tumor at the age of 38 years old. His brother, Ira Gershwin, was his partner, uh, his lyricist, and uh, he didn't write the lyrics to this until after his brother passed. So it makes the lyrics that much more poignant, and especially for this occasion. Here is Love is Here to Stay. It's very For our last selection, I looked uh, at our current repertoire to see what might fit for today and made an assumption, I hope rightly, that you won't mind something a little lively. 
And uh, I figured uh, we're celebrating a life well lived and lively is <laughs> goes with the occasion. Um, so this is a song that I actually wrote with a friend years ago and always thought it would make a nice choir piece and arrange for the choir. Um, the lyrics imagine, uh, seek to imagine a place transcendent uh, from everyday life and uh, that we are all connected, which I just uh, heard the last speaker talk about the rings of connection. I thought, well, that's very apropos. Uh, so here is uh, a song um, that I hope you will enjoy. I also want to acknowledge um, a soloist, Elizabeth Dudley, on this song, and joining us on Cajon will be Matthew Borden. And uh, here is Where the Angels Live. Check, check. Sound is in 
enchanting, beckoning from within. Daya, daya, come around, hear the sound. Come around, hear the sound. Gather round where the angels live on the mountain side. Well, I have to say I'm really happy to be able to be up here and speak about my friend Rich. Uh, I'm a hairdresser. I have been for 48 years. And I, I don't know exactly how long Rich has come in, somewhere between 30 and 40 years. So somewhere in there, over 35 years, we got to know him. And it's interesting because Rich and I, I feel like, became very good friends. And many people might look at us and think we're almost opposites. And in many ways we are. We truly are. You know, but we also had a lot in common. We both loved to fish, gone on some fishing trips, and we always tell bigger fish stories. We both loved to play backgammon, so we try, We attempted every year to have a lunch date that we would go and have this backgammon tournament. Now, I put together backgammon tournaments. I compete a lot. I consider myself a, a good backgammon player. And you know, in all those years, I never beat Rich. <laughs> we went on a fishing trip. The last fishing trip I went with him, and uh, because I had to have shoulder surgery, and this is right prior to it, so I wasn't able to really cast. So, oh, we'll take care of that. You know, he, he always figures out a way. He got out in the boat, would have me drop my line, hit the boat real fast, get some line out, kill it again. I'd start fishing and caught my fish. And you know, that very last game we played, I won. But I'm not so certain that Rich didn't let me win that game. <laughs> you know, he had more interest in others than he did himself. I can remember when I very first met him, he was so, he just kept asking me question after question. Now, um, someone was talking about how he's a Renaissance man. And it's very true. I think what he didn't get to try on himself, he'd even live it through others. You know, I, I have a salon, I have 20 employees there and uh, Rich would come in. I might have a new employee who's helping. Maybe they were gonna shampoo his hair or something. And he would just ask them so many questions, learn everything about their life. Not, not the other way around. He would just, and he would just pump them up. And afterwards, they come in the back room there. Wow, he's such a nice guy. And everybody's feeling so good. And I just, I think that's one of the greatest qualities that I, I learned from Rich is to show more interest in others than yourself. He really did that. You know, my wife uh, went, turned to Rich. She, she got this concept for a nonprofit. It was to be like a missionary in your own neighborhood. She's put together high school students with senior citizens really in need. They may be going through cancer, or some disabilities, or they're just not quite able to take care of themselves. And Rich would speak to her on the phone for hours. And then he would say, well, okay, give me 30 minutes. I'll call you back. He'd call her back and he'd have this whole, this whole business plan written up, everything, step by step, what to do, how to do, that sort of thing. And... Um, I really wish that he was here right now because my wife 
this has grown so much. The entire the school districts that we work with, they're on, they're part of it. It's gonna be part of the CTE program. These students are gonna be able to get school credits for it. They get volunteer hours. And just the way that it's bringing children, you know, young, the youth and the elderly together is amazing. She had this event, 80 people were there. And it was like ants. It was this mobile home park that was not in very good shape. Everyone there was older and, and many of them couldn't take care of it. And it was like ants, just all of a sudden, everything was cleaned up and cleared out. They had all these high school kids, they did a luncheon for all these people who many of them even were neighbors, didn't know each other and they had them all together. And all the high school students were teaching them how to use their phones and their iPads so they could order groceries and things. It was amazing. In fact, it's taken it to such a level that on the 31st of this month, the Senate has a resolution acknowledging this. And it all started with Rich. It's pretty cool. So I attended Green River many years. I, you know, I was in my 40s when I started to go to Green River here. I just decided I wanted to go through. I went through the welding program, which kind of the opposite of me. I, I'm more of an artist. Well, I was doing it because I wanted to do sculptures. And most of the people in the welding program are pretty tough guys. You know, they're going to be riveters. They're going to be building bridges and ships and that sort of thing. And Al ran the the welding program then, this Italian man who'd been there for years, kind of a tough guy himself. And he ended up getting sick and had to leave. And so he wanted the best he could find. And he had had a student years ago, he believed that there's an Olympics for welding. And he won the bronze medal in the World Olympics, one of his students, his name's Scott. He, he runs a welding program to this day. And when Scott Schreiber got here, he was tough, too, because, you know, everything he did was flawless. And you just you had to try and, you know, do the best job you could. So one day he calls me in his office. I'm like, oh, man, what did I do? I, I, you know, so I'm kind of all nervous. I go in the office. He just closed the door behind me. So I close the door and he goes, so your friend, Mr. Rakowski? <laughs> you know, I, I'm trying to get my tenure. Can you put in a good word for me? <laughs> I thought that was great. Rich came in the salon one time, and he had this huge stack of books. Now, we're both voracious readers. That's another thing we had in common. And these books were thick, hardcover, first edition books. Big ones. And some of the price tags on them, they're like $70. I mean, he had this big stack of books. I, I didn't quite understand. He said, Marv, these seven books are the books that made the biggest difference in my life. When I read these books, they just made me think or look at the world differently. And I'd like you to have these books. I thought, wow, that, that really touched me. That's really something. And I don't even know how many of you know this, but he, he was real sick. He, he almost didn't make it. And he never told me that. I never knew that. He was going in for a surgery, and, I, and I'm making up the numbers. I don't know the exact, but he had like a 15% chance of surviving. And he gave me those books before he went into it. But nothing about himself. It was all about me. I, that, that was just amazing. The first time I saw him after the surgery, I was shocked. I, I didn't know. Remember one floor with a cuckoo's nest? Remember when that the guy comes walking out if you had the lobotomy? I mean, that, that's what I thought Rich looked like. He couldn't talk hardly. He couldn't walk. Half of his body didn't. But look at what he did. He came back around. You couldn't even tell slightly. I mean, that guy's amazing. He really pushes through things. So I cut Rich's hair for a long time. And after he went through that, going through radiation, chemo, all that, he started losing a lot of hair. And over the years, you know, as men do, they start to lose their hair. It got to a point where when he was coming in, I kind of didn't really have any hair to cut. I, I start and I turn away from there and just pretend like I'm still cutting. I just keep, you know, just make him feel better, right? <laughs> How's that looking? Turn to this side, like this again, you know. Um, you know, my other employees are looking at me, winking at me, you know, that sort of thing. But I think it was our social life, you know, it was a way that we still got to spend time every month together, you know, hang out. I really appreciated that. So, you know, another thing Rich and I have in common is we both married up. We would talk about that. He married Shirley. I married my wife. I, now, I feel like we have really good taste. I don't know what it says about our wives, but we have great taste. You know, I don't know if you really realize how much Shirley was the adventurer in the family. I mean, she climbed Mount Rainier. She would do all those things. She was the one that would really go for all that. And Shirley would watch by the side. In fact, uh, Rich's motto 
If at first you don't succeed, don't take up skydiving. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, hello, I am um, his daughter, and I am here to read a poem that he really liked by Alfred Tennyson. Um, it's called Crossing the Bar. Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me. And may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to sea. But such a tide as moving seems asleep, too full for sound and foam. When that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home. Twilight and evening bell, and after that the dark, and may there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out are born of time and place, the flood may bear me far. I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. And I think that's a really moving poem that is sort of in relation to his boating um, adventures and love of being on the water and um, being out in the open sea and um, I just think it's really moving. Um, one thing that I also wanted to say is that my dad was a really fantastic photographer. And um, I think uh, I think we have some photos on the table out there that he took. And um, I like to think that somehow I gathered some of those genes from him because my first love is photography, even though I might not make my living that way yet. Um, <laughs> who knows? Um, but I, I really feel honored that he was very talented in that regard. And um, I feel honored to also love photography. And um, it's, it's a passion of mine. So that's all. Hi, I'm Nick McCudden, and I would first like to thank Shirley for asking me to come today to talk to you all about Rich's love of fishing. Uh, with that information, I assume that none of you knew that he liked to fish. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, so, so part of my preparation was to give you a lot of details about his fishing. We're going to have to change that. It sounds like you knew more about his love of fishing than perhaps I did. Um, I do have one question though. I wonder how he had so much time to spend so many days fishing with me when I've heard about all that he's accomplished over the years with you all. Um, but anyway, Rich and I met um, in 1993 when I moved to town and attended my first meeting of the uh, Puget Sound Anglers Club uh, where he was a founding member. Uh, we immediately hit it off and started a relationship which continued without interruption over the time. During this year, we engaged in, I couldn't tell you how many, several dozen fishing trips together, ranging from a single day to uh, a week or more. Uh, Rich was certainly liked, I can assure you, and admired by not virtually, literally everybody that ever met him in the fishing club. He was a great guy, great class, uh, extremely knowledgeable, 
a good travel companion and an excellent fisherman. So to prepare uh, for this talk today, rather than just share my own experiences with Rich, I try to get some input from some of the other club members who fish with Rich pretty regularly. Um, the first uh, was from a fellow by the name of uh, Scott Cattell, a mutual friend, and asked to uh, see if there was a story that they could tell that not only detailed Rich's love and effectiveness at fishing, but what a great person he was. And Scott tells a story about fishing with Rich many years ago on one of the rivers on the Olympic Peninsula for steel, winter steelhead. Scott forgot the name of the river, but it's probably not too important. But it was one of the typical winter days on the coast, raining, sleeting, snowing, cold. They were fishing, standing on the side of a pool of a river, knee deep, wearing neoprene waders, uh, casting out to the middle of the river, trying to get a steelhead coming through. When Rich thought he had a bite, <laughs> reel back hard to set the hook. There was no fish there, and he ended up underwater backwards. <laughs> he quickly caught up. And the, the important thing to tell something about Rich was that he never once complained. He never, he was taking a, quite a bit of ribbing from the other people on the stream fishing in his area. And he very good naturedly took the whole thing, continued fishing throughout the entire day. Uh, that story didn't, I didn't know it, but that story didn't surprise me. Another mutual friend uh, of ours, a fellow by the name of um, Tom Nelson. Tom was the original founder of the Puget Sound Anglers. And Tom told a story where he and many other club who had uh, members who had boats, hauled their boats up to the northwest corner of Vancouver Island, a place called Winter Harbor, uh, to fish for, uh, for King Salmon. And I guess there was four or five boat members who had their boats up there, and they more or less fished in the same area during the entire trip. Well, uh, at one point, they stopped fishing for king salmon and went to an area near the base of the lighthouse at the outside of the harbor. It was pretty well known for both the lingcod and halibut, both bottom fish. The lingcod were in the rocky parts and the halibut were in, on the gravel part. And this was normally a, a very good place to catch a lot of fish, but for whatever reason, all the boats, which were fairly tightly uh, gathered around each other, were catching nothing. Um, all of a sudden, Rich got, again, a big bite. And uh, after a big struggle, uh, the fish came to the side of the boat. And Tom tells me he looked down, and it was a monstrous uh, uh, humble squid. There were years in the past where the water off the coast of Washington got warm, and a lot of Mexican game fish came up and uh, went all the way up into Alaska. Well, Tom estimated that the, the squid was probably close to 50 pounds. And they looked down at it, and Rich had a very expensive jig on. And he didn't want to lose the jig, so he asked somebody to grab a gaff or two, and they gaffed the squid into the boat. Big mistake. <laughs> big, big mistake. The squid went nuts. <laughs> and the suction cupping his way around the boat. Everybody was running and banging into each other. Finally, the squid climbed up the gunnel, grabbed Rich's fish finder, and ripped it off. <laughs> ripped it off. At that point, Rich got ticked. <laughs> and he got out a fillet knife, and he started chopping at the, at the arms of the, the squid, and through many hacks, they were throwing pieces of squid overboard. <laughs> they finally got the squid under control. And about the, about the time, I'm sure the timing was coincidental. It had nothing to do with it. It was probably a tide change. But um, the fish started biting. And everybody started catching, but it was halibut or link cod. Tom, Tom didn't say. But many, teasingly, uh, accused or thanked Rich for starting the bite. They said he was chumming. <laughs> and for the days thereafter at the house that they rented that they all shared um, they, they referred to him as the chummer and they were constantly asking him for his special techniques on how to properly chum <laughs> so I thought that was kind of interesting um, 
Rich, among other things, other than being a great fisherman, but tied to it, he was he was particularly generous and humble and kind. And let me talk about the, the generosity part. Um, it was a period of about 12 years that I kept two boats year round up in Sitka, Alaska. One was an aluminum center console, pretty nondescript boat, very simple, not a lot of stuff on it. The other was a 26 foot tally craft with a flying bridge and it had all kinds of stuff on it. Uh, electrical, hydraulic, refrigerator, free, you know, just tons and tons of stuff. Well, each year at the end of the season, usually around October, I took the boat, I had the boat professionally hauled out of the water, put on, on dry land, and then I would spend several days building with two by fours, four by eight sheets of plywood, and tarps and ropes. I would tent the entire boat to protect it from those tough Southeast Alaska winters, constant temperature fluctuations below freezing, above freezing, constant rain followed by snow, followed by rain. It's really tough on boats. Well, Rich and another good friend of mine who happens to be here today came in from California, uh, uh, Tim Maddox. They would come volunteer, they would take a week of vacation every year and come up and work every day for a week on my boat, uh, fixing it, replacing, I mean, over the years, over the 12 years I was there, I think we replaced everything, like the, the engine, the, you know, I had five bilge pumps, new refrigerator, freezer, radar, everything. And um, they would get the boat ready for their return later in the year and uh, uh, have hopefully nonstop fishing when they come up to go fishing. Well, when I say we repaired these things and we maintained these things, I'm speaking somewhat figuratively. Uh, I've got no mechanical skills. Uh, they did it, they did it all. Uh, as a matter of fact, they would periodically send me out to get food or, <laughs> or parts that probably weren't needed whenever I was asking too many questions. Um, Um, later in the year, they would come, as they said, on one, two, or three additional weeks of fishing. Uh, early, early on, we discovered, and this sounds fictitious, but it's literally true. When we anchored too close to shore at many locations away from the main dock, we could be 50, 60, 70 miles away. Um, if we anchored too close to shore, little bugs that the natives called noceums, and they bit, they would swarm us if out on the deck and they attacked Rich, but they would leave us alone. <laughs> Why? I have no idea, it, it, but it's, it's literally true. And this was group after group. Sometimes it was Rich with other people. Um, and we could Rich about that a pretty good deal. Well, after the first time that it occurred, Rich was prepared and he brought up with him on his next trip and left it up there for the remaining 10, 12 years a electronic badminton sized fly swatter. I'd never seen one before. The batteries were in the handle and if you swatted a fly and got it, it would, you got a little spark sometimes and the bug was dead. Well, Rich would be out there every time that occurred. But the worst, the worst time that that happened was, um, uh, I think it was a, a September trip, probably the last trip of the year. And I was with uh, uh, Tim Mannix, the fellow I mentioned before, who happens to be here tonight as well, and Rich. And we were up in a, a harbor on the north end of Cruise Off Island. And we were out on the back deck after we anchored the boat. And the no seams came in like, you can't even believe. It, 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 it just swarms them. Well, we were driven off the deck. We went into the cabin. We shut the doors. And we discovered that the no seams knew how to get in under the, the doors. So we spent the next half hour with paper towels, packing the, the bottom of the door and the tops of the hatches in places where the no seams could get through. Well, Tim and I sat back as Rich was running around with his tennis racket, making sparks. And we counted over a hundred sparks and zaps before Rich finally got the control of the situation. And at that point, the martinis were made and the evening was a success. 
Um, of all the fishing occasions that we did, we, we at one point uh, decided, Rich and I, that we got along real well, uh, but we should maybe try to expand our relationship a little bit. So I think I came up with the idea of you know doing something a little more cultural or and culturally enhancing. And I learned that there were three, I think, Puccini operas being offered by the um, uh, Seattle uh, Opera Company. And I convinced him and Lyndon Green, who is also here tonight, to take our wives to see the three operas. And the first one we liked a lot. It was great. It was, it was terrific. A month or so later was the second one. The second one, not so much. The third one, we didn't like it all. We all said, that's it on the operas. <laughs> we're going we're to do something a little bit less sophisticated. So then I got the idea that there was at the University of Washington that has cultural exchanges and musical uh, performances, that there was a, a supposedly a world famous violinist who I'd never heard of before, but I'm not a musician, but uh, who was coming to perform. Uh, I know it wasn't uh, Isaac Perlman, it wasn't Isaac Stern, and it wasn't Pinkus Zuckerman, but some guy whose name I forget. <laughs> well, we didn't find it wonderful at all, but they good-naturedly, uh, Rich and Shirley and everyone else, sat through it and smiled, and uh, we said, that, that's going to be it. So no more expansion of our interests beyond fishing. We're going we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna stick to fishing. Uh, During our many fishing trips with Rich, as an accomplished uh, photographer that you've learned about today, he would frequently take a lot of pictures. And at the end of the trip, he would organize those pictures and have a book published um, containing the highlights of the trip. Uh, because he was the cameraman and the one who was doing this, um, uh, there's, he's not in a lot, he's in some of the pictures in the book, but not as many as ideally I would like. But I would encourage you, I've got three or four or four of those books out on the counter. And uh, you, I think you'll get the essence of a lot of our fishing trips, the joy we had. And a lot of it comes from the experience of being together rather than fishing itself. So that's about it. I'll tell you, I am certainly going to miss Rich. Good afternoon, I'm George Frazier. I'm the Vice President for College Advancement here at the college. And we're gonna spend just a few minutes with an open mic. And I have some folks out there in the audience who have a microphone. So you see Josh and I think uh, Monica back there in the corner. We've probably got, uh, looks like Monica and Matt over there on the side. So I'm having a hard time seeing a bit. So if you were to raise your hand or even better, stand up if you would like to speak. And while you're, our, what place we got one back there? There we go. Monica, are you here? Hello, my name is John Knowlton. I've uh, been teaching journalism here for 22 years. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that I got into early was quoting. And Josh Gertzman, right down here, uh, was working at the college at the time. And he came up to me and says, you got to go talk to Rich about a new boat. I said, what, you get a new boat? He said, yeah, got a Ranger Tug. And I said, oh, my gosh. So I walked into Ricky's office, knocked on the door. He says, hey, Doug, come on in. And he started talking about his 25-foot Ranger Tug. And he couldn't shut him up. He was so excited about it. Uh, and then at the end, he says, John, tugnuts.com. Go to tugnuts.com. So I went to tugnuts.com, wound up going to the Seattle Boat Show, and uh, uh, got a 21-foot Ranger Tug. And next thing I know, I'm going with Shirley and Rich on these Ranger Tug rendezvous throughout Puget Sound and up into, up into uh, southeast Alaska. And uh, Rich later upgraded to a 29-foot Ranger Tug. In every place that I went, people... Loved Richard Kowski, the Ranger Tug people, had all kinds of respect for him. And one of the things that he and Shirley were best known for in all these Ranger Tug uh, 
uh, rendezvous was, and you've heard mention of it before, martinis. <laughs> Rich made a great, great martini. So uh, he was well known for that. And the Ranger Tuck guys loved him uh, and Shirley as well. One other small, brief um, anecdote. Uh, several years ago, the Board of Trustees uh, escorted the then president of the college out the door. Some of you know who, what I'm referring to. And I had dinner that evening with uh, a colleague from the college. And we said, well, who's going to be, you know, the interim college president? And I said, you just call Rich. So I said, I'll call him. I, I have no bones about that. My, my journalism background kicked in. So I called Rich. And I said, Rich, you know what happened tonight? I said, yeah, I know. Said, we think you guys, you should be the new interim college president. And he was very diplomatic. And he said, no. No, that's up to the Board of Trustees. And I worked him hard trying to get him to say yes, yes, yes. And he didn't, but he also didn't say no. So I came away from the conversation knowing how much he really, really loved Green River Community College. So that's my anecdote. Thank you. Who's next? Thanks, Josh. Hi, everyone. And uh, Shirley, we're so sorry for your loss. My name is Larry Brown, and I was appointed to the Board of Trustees uh, at Green River in 1997. And um, I was an hourly worker at Boeing. And, uh, you know, I, I would just say that I joined this uh, Board of Trustees and had successful business leaders, successful community leaders. And here I'm an hourly guy and a machinist activist. And I walk into those board meetings and I'm thinking, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, I'm not out of my league here. And uh, I mentioned that to Rich, and maybe I shouldn't be here. And uh, he wouldn't have any of that nonsense. He told me, he says, look, he says, everybody here has something to contribute. You have life experience that nobody else here has. And he helped mentor me. And I would just say this, that, uh, you know, in my life, I don't know of another man that had more to do with my leadership development as Richard Kowski. And I'm so appreciative of that. You know, we all have heard about his competitive nature. Uh, you know, I took up racquetball with him and I'll tell you, when he had the angle, you better not step in front of it because <laughs> you're gonna feel it on your shoulder <laughs> as that 100 mile an hour racquetball came at you. Uh, and then, you know, he was competitive in all things, uh, large and small. Uh, I know we've heard about how uh, Green River benefited from his competitive nature for buildings here on campus. And the campus was transformed during the 13 years that I was here on the, as a trustee. Uh, but I remember we used to go to the, the Hotel uh, Olympia, formerly the Red Lion, and um, there is the, uh, the cover where right in front of the entrance where you could drive up and offload your, your uh, luggage. Uh, but he, there were two parking stalls. One was a handicapped parking stall and one was a regular parking stall. I don't know how he did it, but that big blue suburban of his was always parked right up there in front of the door. Uh, but it was probably because he came early and he stayed late and he did the work. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. In the back. Hi, my name is Scott Scheffler. Um, I didn't know Rich very long. I knew him for about five or six years. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Green River College and Rich for being the magnificent guy he was to get a place like this to, to honor his life. Um, I only knew him a fairly short while. I met him through my good friend, Nick, and uh, uh, I, I had, a, you know, right away, I, I just loved Rich as a friend. He, uh, he, he did, he, he uh, always had attention towards, uh, you know, knowing people, wanting to know more about people's lives. And in so, he enriched mine. Uh, I, uh, I don't, I find myself sad uh, at this occasion, even though it's a it's a celebration of his life, but it's sad that I don't know I no longer have him to uh, learn from. I learned a lot from him just from maybe three or four times that I saw him on fishing trips. 
I was lucky enough to go fishing with him in Alaska on two or three occasions. And uh, it was just an absolute reward uh, for me to uh, be around the man. He, uh, he was quite an interesting fellow. He took a little long in the bathrooms when we wanted to go fishing. So uh, that kind of annoyed me a little bit about Rich, but you know, uh, <laughs> we, we didn't need to be out there that long in this case. Uh, that, that's another thing about Rich. He had such a fondness for navigation and understanding uh, electronics and so forth. Uh, you know, everything that I've heard today is just verification uh, of everything I've uh, felt about him. And, and uh, it's a real honor to be his friend. And uh, it's, I'm sorry that he's, uh, that he's passed. You know, obviously uh, we're all gonna feel that loss probably in the, you know, in the Green River Community College uh, area here. Uh, I, I had known that he was a, a president of this college. I didn't know how he became president really, but uh, I did know he was a C, uh, like a tax, he, he told me he was a tax practice owner and he wasn't, a, a, I don't think he told me he was a CPA or not, but I'm in the CPA field. <laughs> and, and I'm like, well, how in the heck did you have time to do all this stuff? And, and it's just uh, amazing. And Rich, you were an amazing guy. I hope you're watching and laughing and smiling because we all love you. Thanks. Thank you. We're gonna give Anne Marie the last word. Well, uh, thank you so much. Bear with me. I'm public speaking. It's not my forte. <laughs> but um, thank you so much to everyone for coming. Everyone's words about my father ring, have rung so true tonight. And it's everyone's statements and everyone's stories have brought a little piece of him back to life. And it's just wonderful to hear how many lives he touched and how many people loved him. I really appreciate all of your stories. Um, growing up as his daughter wasn't always easy. Um, you think of your parents as your role models, and those are really big shoes to fill. <laughs> um, and there's when his mother passed away, um, little prayer cards were, were, she was Catholic, and little prayer cards were printed out with the prayer of St. Francis on them. And this poem just kind of epitomizes a little bit of how he was as well. And I just wanted to read it really quick, just on my phone here. But um, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that a I may not so much seek to be consoled as to consult, to, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. I'll let that sink in for just a second. This is a dangerous spot in the program. I'm between you and food and drink, so I will be drink, very brief. Uh, a few words of appreciation. Rakowski family, thank you for sharing this day with us. Uh, when your dad uh, made the choice to hire me 15 years ago, he changed my life. And there are many, many folks in this room that that is true of as well. So I thank you for that um, very, very much and thank him for that. Uh, some folks who made this day happen, uh, Megan Evans and Tanya McClavey led the effort to make uh, today uh, go. Thank you so much. They were supported by our colleagues in college relations, conference services, the Welding and Advanced Manufacturing faculty and foundation staff. Uh, we appreciate your teamwork very, very much. Finally, uh, I want to thank our donors to the Rich and Shirley Rakowski Endowment, uh, particularly lead donors, College Spark Washington, Giza Credit Union, PEMCO Insurance, and the many of you in this room who are individual donors. Over the past decade, Rich and Shirley's endowment has invested 
over $116,000 in scholarships and emergency funding for students. It will continue to do so as long as there's a Green River College. This concludes our live stream and in-person ceremony. Please join us in the lobby for food, drink, and community building. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for coming.